key to cleaning this off, first of all, when I hand you your 11 millimeter rod or your 12 mil rod, look at it and decide which is the ugliest end and make that the side that you clean off. When we go to clean off, we want to do this without elongating this piece. That's not going to help us. Because I, I almost, often in this class, I will just make you start with that cut off piece because at least I know that you didn't go to clean this off and pull like a point or something like that. So I, I'm going to want this to be still kind of dull at the end here. So this was a pretty nasty break off of that rod. So, eh, you know, this, this rod's a little, you know, you also, today's so much on focus on the technique and stuff, but you know, you can, I've noticed like, oh, this rod's a little dirty. You know, when you get to the shop in the morning, get some Windex or whatever and clean off your rods. You know, some of that stuff that's on the surface of your rod will just vaporize and not be a factor, but some of that stuff's gonna boil in and leave bubbles and whatnot, so. Anyway, you don't have to do that. I just need to kind of give myself that finished rod, end of rod look. All right, so, again, before we get too far or anything, I want you guys to look around the station to make sure you have what you need. We're gonna have, we're gonna have, your, you all have a graphite pad that's gonna be set up in front of your torch. Your dichro is gonna be right underneath your flame. We'll have a small rod already cut down that we can use as a handle to pick up our dichroic. And since we did just kind of, you know, review this, I'm going to kind of, like I said, I'll kind of gloss over this a little faster. But again, that's one of the trade-offs. When I give a demo, you know, it's always nice when you're at your station because you're just going to be able to work through it. And that always, again, just working through stuff lends itself to the end result. You know, it's sometimes stopping and stuff. You lose heat base, excuse me, and you can start to fight that. So. A lot of times I'll encourage you to just keep going and learn through repetition. And, uh, and and sometimes you have to see the bad results to learn from them too, you know? So, and it's on you to look at those results and and extrapolate something from that. Look at them and, and be like, all right, what do I want to improve, or et cetera, et cetera. So, all right, here we go. I'm gonna pick up this piece of dichroic. Like I said, we're starting with about an inch long piece for this project. I could probably even be a little bit shorter, but that's fine. What, whatever you do with the piece of dichroic, you do not want it to be cut wider than the rod you're using. So if you cut up your dichro at the, in the morning and then all of a sudden you have a piece that's too wide, that will work against you. So even this one's probably almost like 12 mil. I've got a one that's a little bit more of a narrow cut. I think I'm gonna off use that one. Again, coating side down. When I go to connect this piece of dichro, one of the things I was going to say too is the thing that's you, real quickly, the thing that's unique about the coating itself is the, co the dichro coating is not compatible with glass. It actually doesn't melt and become part of the matrix. It's actually just kind of floating in there. And so that's why when you use it, the it breaks into particles. The glass that it's on just, you know, blends into the, the material itself, but the coating itself doesn't become part of the glass. It's breaking up into these particles. So that said, since it's not actually compatible, when you go to lay this piece down, the coating itself is a resist. So if you don't have enough heat on this piece, it's not going to receive it. And a lot of times too, I'll see people try to lay down their piece of dichroic, but the coating isn't really that sticky. So the way I mitigate that is, when I pick this up, as I was showing you that technique, when I go to make that initial connection, I try to touch this edge because it's exposed glass, and that's going to stick. The other thing is I'm very specific about where I heat. If you guys are preheating this to make that initial attachment, if the last inch of this is hot and floppy, you don't have a platform to set your glass down on. So we're gonna, I want you to start with a small flame. You heat about you know one inch below, right where you think that initial edge might connect. And then you know, well, that part's sticky. I'll make the connection. Then I can come in with a tool and help put it in position. But. Um, Try not to have too much of your glass rod when you go to make that uh, initial lay down of the dichroic. All right, here we go. See if I can get this done without talking to you guys. All right, a little bit of preheat on the rod. I'm gonna pick up the dichroic. I'll still need to activate it. Pick it up right away. Tip of the rod facing away. Dichro comes off as an extension of the rod I, I picked it up with. A little bit of preheat, start at the back of the plane, just kind of feathering it over the surface, looking for the rigidity of the plate glass to just exhale or slightly relax, or that and that coating to break up and fracture. All right, I see a little bit of glow. Look at the coating. I know that it's fractured up. It's ready to go. It's hardened up. Putting the uh, non 
dichro side in this lane, correct? Yes, absolutely. The coated side does, does not receive direct flame contact. All right, time to lay this down. What again, I'm gonna try to make that exposed edge of the dichroic piece connect, and then I'll heat behind the piece, again, coating side away. The tool will allow me to just apply a little bit of pressure and we'll lay the piece of dichroic down. Again, by laying it down this way, it expels air. If you take your piece and just slap it down flat, sometimes you'll trap a, like a flat little sheet uh, bubble, like a little flat air bubble in there. So again, by connecting this edge and laying it down, kind of rolling it down, it expels air and then we can get to the final type of sealing it down. So all right, again, I didn't make it without talking. A little bit of pre, pick that specific spot I want that initial connection to make. See a little bit of glow, tag it, heat behind at the base, and just lay that down. When I get to the end, I pin the dichro to the torch head, and I give this, this handle a little uh, shift on this axis, and that pops that off. Now, again, I, can't, I don't want to stop because that's not really bonded on there. It'd be real easy for that piece of dichro to pop off of this now. And so I should have, oh, I meant to put one by everyone. So you can use a paddle or in this case, I like to use a butter knife. And this is a case where I want you guys to use the torch head. What we're going to do, again, and this will done, be done in a few small like baby steps. We're gonna apply the heat to the back of the dichro being very conscious about how we enter the flame. It's still exposed on the edges there. You see that? If I go in there casually and I let the flame get under there, it can burn out the edges of that before I even get this sealed. The goal here is going to apply this piece of dichro and take the clear and or dis displace it so that it seals the coating in over the rod. So again, I'm gonna lose my heat base here, but starting at the bottom, a little bit of color. I'm not doing this all in one step. Against the torch head, Lay the butter knife down and rock it back and forth. That forces the glass out to the edges again, will help expel air versus just a flat mash and trap. So I get that part down, again, move up to the middle. This is done in that one inch of dichro being affected in a few steps. You don't want to do this all at once. Small plane for a small job. If you have your outers on right now, that would just be too large of a tool for the task at hand. Get in the very end, almost have this nice and anchored down. Then I can go back one last time and really push that clear over the edges of the dichro. Again, I'll do this in several steps. So now I'm heating it again. As I enter and exit the flame, still consciously thinking about the flame and how it might cheat under that piece until I finally have this truly sealed. All right, there it goes this time. Another key element to what I'm doing right now is the minimal amount of heat I'm using. If this is so hot that you actually get the rod hot, well, when you go to apply this, you're just gonna flatten and distort the whole thing. I'm only getting this hot enough, really, so that the surface is hot, so that this thin piece of Pyrex that the dichro is applied to is getting hot, and the rigidity of the rod allows me to, you know, make that connection and seal in the dichro. And finally, the very end. If you guys wanna kinda of come up here, you can kinda of see now, that the clear's been like pushed over the edges. You actually see where the coating ends, but the, you see that? So that tells me that the, now the dichro is actually truly sealed, and now I'm not gonna be as worried about flame getting it. That said, I still am gonna exercise on the side of caution, and I wouldn't take a second here and give this a lot of heat directly onto that. I'm still about to fold this over, and again, encase this dichro even more into the clear, and that's when that, you know, and again, I can get away with doing this a little bit looser, but if you guys go through it in this process, you're, you're gonna help the results. So now, I'm gonna take the pad that our dichro was on, put it off to the side. Everybody will have one of these nice little solid uh, handles uh, or paddles. I wanna say this, you know, there's a lot of, uh, often there's inexpensive tools. Do not short yourself on a paddle. I mean, if you wanna mash and press your glass, you need a paddle that's been well made so that it's anchored well. Often cheap paddles you'll go to use and they're spinning or rotating because they're on a single post or something like that. And then you have no ability to exert force. I mean, this paddle is only, I think a Blast Shield or uh, Scott Griffin would have a paddle like this for 15 or $20. You can see it's truly anchored in there. And uh, it's just one of those things that I've had a lot of cheap handles over the years that I bought for classes and stuff. And they just, they don't work out, you know. Make sure you don't, don't buy that cheap uh, paddle, get something that's really well made. Hopefully you can identify that when you see that. All right, so 
The next thing I'm going to do is I actually put a little hinge point in this glass. So I'm going to take the, the butter knife that we have on hand with the dichroic side away from the flame. I'm going to heat at the base. Again, small flame for this little task. And I'm going to just create a little weak spot. So I get the glass hot. I just kind of roll the knife. And again, this is so that when I go to heat this, I'm going to heat. It minimizes the glass. It's going to fold very easily there for me. And it just helps in that process. And again, the, the flip side is, uh, if you guys get this too hot, all of a sudden this last half inch, imagine that whole last half inch is just as flexible as a pasta noodle. You have no ability to fold it and have control. By putting in this like hinge point, I hope that helps you remember to just heat that spot because that's the only part of the glass that we really want to be fluid and move right now. Because I want it to fold right there, very specifically like the hinge on a door. The idea is that we're going to fold this over and trap that piece of dichroic between pieces of rod and it's going to be important now that this is centered so here I go take my tweezers looking at it folding it over once I get that it's angled in there fold it over you know if I let this cool down right now I don't want to lose my heat you got to kind of jump in here I'm gonna heat the top and the bottom of this side here I'm not coming in from the side and hitting that piece of micro that's still exposed because the idea here is I'm actually gonna come in here and kind of compress this down. And I don't need heat on the sides. I want to heat the top and the bottom. And notice how I come in and out of the flame. I'm not just casually going from this side, staying in the flame and rotating over there, which would superheat this side and create uneven heat. So I'm heating the bottom, out of the flame, heat the top, out of the flame. And again, this just falls under the umbrella of heat management. I'm putting heat where I need it, where I want to see the glass. Because what's going to happen when I heat the glass this way, when I go to mash it, the glass will displace outwards. And notice, I didn't come out of the flame and just do one big press. That's what people want to do. They want to come out and just press. I did that softly. We want to equally start to compress this dichroic so that it exists in the middle of this. If you just have, if you superheat one side of this rod and then press down on it, you'll actually take that rod and envelop the other rod. I want them both to compress equally, and that's why I make the you know panes to heat each side so that they both compress. If you again, it'd be real easy to just think like, oh, I'm going to go in here, heat this. It's all going to get hot, and I'm, but that's not how Pyrex works. If you don't get equal heating on your Pyrex, the glass is not going to move evenly. So that was a good initial step. The goal ultimately will be to get that dichroic kind of centered in line with the rod in front of it, because right now this glass up here, that's the front of the rod, is ultimately. Ultimately, it will be the glass that lenses that lenses the dichroic. So we're making the little part down here that has all the dichroic mixed up right now, and then we're going to heat and ultimately heat this glass up to build a lens into this. Again, remember, we're trying to make this on a single axis point, so we don't have to be switching around too much. So this needs a little bit more compression. As you can see, the edges of the dichroic are just still kind of out there. And so I'm going to get this hot, just place a little bit more glass out to the side, and then I'll actually start coming in and blocking it in on that seam side also. But I'll do one last top and, top and bottom for right now. One more good compression and try to get that a little bit more centered. And then I'll start to really block it in by hitting all four sides. And again, it's down to the pad, up, flip, press, up, flip. Not, I don't want you guys spending too much time on one side or you, it'll get off axis and uncentered from it. All right, starting to kind of hit the sides that time. I don't know if you guys know this. You can see I'm starting to work that dichro. It's going to just be sandwiched perfectly in between those two. And that's, that's good because ultimately, if, if we get this centered, it's going to be lined up behind the lens. Now, if we don't get that dichro centered, after we spin this up, you actually cast the dichro out to the outer edges and it won't be in the core. And when you look down your galaxy marble, it won't be a burst from the center. It'll be off to the side and you'll have like a wormhole or a little black hole in there. And that's how you rationalize that one when you're selling it. <laughs> so. And when you burn out your dichro, which you won't do after today, you just call it a snow globe. And you're like, oh, this is my Christmas marbles. So. All right, copy again. Well, I want to get this a little bit more uh, cohesive, and so I'll just a couple more paddles, getting this centered. You know, I don't want this to get any longer. I'm not like, again, it's like I want you to hold back a little bit. It's really easy to get in there and just want to press hard. And, 
Well, initially, the, when you come out of the flame, the glass is really soft, so you just gently give it a little push. As it cools down, you can be a little bit more aggressive, but again, it's that sliding scale. When you come out of the flame, the glass still has a lot of flexibility and mobility, so you want to gently kind of, you know, inform it. And then as it cools down, what's that? Now I am. I've transferred to doing it. Now, after I get a good displacement and the glass comes out and seals that, piece of dichroic, I'm not as worried about, I'll come in from the sides and kind of block it in. Right. Almost ready to move on to the next stage, which will be kind of the twisting up, which is the nightmare to watch you guys do, I'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and that's the thing. I wish there was like a, you all had like a little volume control on twist, because I say twist, you guys turn it up to 11, and I'm saying, no, I want you to twist that one, you know? So, a couple things here. This is where you can make a decision about your results. I tend to really like to crank this up. If you really crank it and twist it up, and I mean just multiple, you know, rotations, you'll have a nice big burst, and the dichroic gets broken into these smaller and smaller particles. The less twist, you can have like a slow, lazy ribbon of dichro that goes down there. It just all comes down to what you like in the end results. But um, for the most part today, I'm gonna show you how I, how I, the results that I kind of like, and that involves a lot of twists, but done in a very, very controlled way. The whole action of twisting something or twisting up your glass is a driving force that forces things out. That's why a screw pulls itself in or, you know, comes out. But we do not want to elongate this at all. So I want these to be very small, stunted twists. I don't want to see anybody like, oh, look at me, I'm twisting this up. Because you're going to end up with this ropey, big, chunky thing, and you're going to start extending your hands. The worst thing that I'll probably be seeing here in the next 20 minutes is that somebody will be twisting this up, they're going to stretch it out like they're pulling a cane. It's really hard to collapse that down. There's nothing you can do. So it's, I need you guys to focus on twisting this, small and controlled steps. This may be seem like a small piece of glass, but we're going to twist this in like three to four sections and work our way down because small baby steps are the way to go because large things are just going to create exaggerated problems. So. I'm going to want you to have more than just your center fire going, so kind of a medium flame. We kind of take our outer stage and have, you know, some flame coming in there, but, you know, not the most powerful flame, but a little bit more than just a center fire would provide because we want to get the glass on. So this can be, a, you know, whatever type of weld you want because it's going to get pretty fused on there. But we're going to put a small handle. When we go to t twist up this dichroic, it's really important that we start at the lens side. It's real easy to get back here and get this hot and twist it up, and then you'll end up with a galaxy where it's all twisted up back here, but this part's a little static and dead because it's hard to exert force up here if it's liquid back here. So I like you guys to start up here, and that way where this fold comes over, a lot of times there'll be seams. By putting the heat up there, that all gets resolved into the lens right away. So as I heat up this little plug of glass here at the back, I'm really just gonna focus on getting the, the top 25 to 30% hot. I'm not letting my, that's so important here. You've gotta keep your arms together. Don't let your hands drift out or stretch out. Otherwise, you're just gonna get a slightly sarcastic comment from me and then lots of encouragement about how we're gonna. But yeah, just again, just let's keep that in mind. So I get that hot. I don't do my twisting in the flame. I kinda get that hot, come out of the flame, little nudge, nudge, that's all, just that small. Then when I go back in, the little ropiness that I did create starts to resolve and melt in. I don't want to see this, because what happens if you have that ropey low and high points, those high points will sometimes melt in and create these bubbles. And so by doing this in, again, the small kind of staggered step, you kind of resolve all the ropiness. And by the time I'm done with this, I should have something that's a little bit more, like I said, just all cohesive and not like some section of just big twisted up glass. It's like a ba I'm barely nudging it. I just heat. Remember I said a, there was a scale of 11 to 1? I'm on 1. So if 11 is a full time, you're on 1? I'm going to be, again, there, we, there, we do not have a vocabulary that's going to allow us to satisfy that <laughs> question. I'm just saying you have, it's minimal. Yeah, there's not a like a, a fraction that has an answer there. All I can say is if I see you go, or if I come over and I notice that you have these big things, I, it's the telltale of what's happened. You, that's not gonna happen here. I'm just letting the glass, I'm not, it doesn't have to be totally fluid. 
it's better to work with this like more of a consistency of clay because you have more control. When this glass is totally fluid, it's hard to exact any amount of control on it. And again, just notice I'm just leaving this stunted. I'm not pushing in either. I've, I've noticed people a little lately, they're so focused on not stretching their hands out that they're pushing in and we don't necessarily want that yet either. But again, just in and out not letting it get away from me. If it gets too hot and too out of control, just come out of the flame, let it settle down and cool. And every time you're pulling it out, you I'm just like a teeny tiny bit. It's probably a 32nd or a 16th of a full 360 degree stretch. I know, I did that just for you. That Thank was you, for you. That was like the math person. talking through. Yeah. I knew that you needed it. But I didn't. I could have also told told you to, to divide 360 by 11, and then you would have got the answer. If it, and it would have been by 10, not of all, because 11, of course, is the Spinal Tap tribute. It's not that it actually has 11. It's 10. And yeah, and then it would have been 136, which I said a 32nd, right? Or did I say 36? We'll cut to tape and check on that later. <laughs> all right. Anyway, so now you can see in there. You guys want to take a look at this? I'll let it cool down. You can see it's. A lot of rotations in there. Not burnt out, no little fuzzy whiteness going on. Yeah, so now we've got this. We've got a handle on here. It's time to like, we're gonna, this, and again, this will be one of those things that takes, it just takes practice and time, but we're gonna bulk up the front of this with a little bit of a lens. The key to making a lens is First of all, sometimes, you know, as we get this hot, again, we can't let our hands drift apart. What I, the way I think about it is I try to heat the glass in such a way that it flows down and becomes the lens. I'm not trying to push it because, again, you'll see the results of pushing something in. You'll create a Maria with something that's very steep, like a steep shelf. And what I would like to do with this is I'm going to try to heat up this clear rod because, of course, this is the part that's going to flow down and become the lens. And I want to heat it up in such a way that this plug of dichroic that we created kind of goes along for the ride. So it's on the back end kind of opening up too as we build up the lens, rather than just heating this up, pushing and creating some big blob of clear in front of this. It should be a marrying of the two with the bulk of the heat in the clear, okay? So I have a, uh, you know, my outers are going, nice even flame, I've adjusted my center fire. The bandwidth of the flame, the right edge of the flame is the dichroics just peeking in from the, the, the plug there that I've made. And the bulk of the flame is going into the clear rod. I'm holding it at an angle so that the heat travels upward into the clear and it's just, and, and an angle down so that also the glass is flowing. You can already see the glass is starting to expand right where that dichroic is. And if it starts to get away from me, I, I can level out and react to that. But again, I need you guys to help me by reacting to the glass. When you see something happening or if it feels like it's getting out of control, do yourself a favor and just come out and let it cool down. But again, now it's now as I start to get a bit of the flow of the glass going and I see that the dichroic's involved, it's at the base of the lens, I'll cheat over a little bit more into the clear. And now I can start to build some clear in front of the clear that I've already started as a base for the lens. And the key is, you know, you just don't want to have this really exaggerated shape going on where the lens is all, um, feels like it's a separate entity from that back plug. You can see how there's just something they, they kind of are blending together there. And again, this is kind of a small scale rod or project. We don't need to make it do too much of a lens. I just want you guys to get the practice of adding that dichroic and the fold. I mean, there's going to be a lot in this for you guys already since this is your first day doing this type of stuff. Dichro looks pretty good in there. Got the lens built up. Gonna come out of the plane, keep it on center. I think that's enough lens for this. We're not gonna, I'm not gonna sit there and add a bunch more. I'm actually gonna let this cool down. So one of the reasons I like to get this um, lens built up before I do anything with the back is that this actually gives us a larger footprint to work with to melt in the back. Now, if you had melted the back and had a ball and then tried to melt in front of it, there, that actually doesn't lend itself as well to this. By having a larger footprint, now we're gonna be able to take the handle off, really put some heat back there, and again, have that part marry into this lens section. And we'll be able to be more aggressive with the heat because we have a larger footprint to be working with. 
versus having the back of the marble all rounded out and then trying to add lens to it. Which also works, you can do it either way. No, no one way to do these either. Right. Gonna clean that back area. So, when you have something like this, it's kind of like a little tower or a high point. The way you want to heat glass like that, again, and I think it's not, it's slightly counterintuitive, our intuition would be like, oh, I better heat the top of that so it all melts down. That's actually the opposite of what we want to do. We want to heat at the base. So that the glass expands from the base and the top recedes at the same time. And you're less likely, sometimes if you do it the other way, you may end up gathering on the end and folding something over or trapping air. But by starting at the base of that little extended section of dichroic plug, that glass will, again, flow out at the base and marry into the lens. Again, notice the angle I'm holding the glass right now. I'm totally shielding this area. It's not going to get floppy and away from me. I can't come in. I'm talking to you right now. I can't come in from the back and let this lens divert thing and then have this fold on me. I've got to move. I've got to move my torch. I've got to do something and react to the glass. So I'm hitting right where the lens begins and the dichroic plug begins or ends, whatever, however you want to look at that. All right. Yeah, I want that. It has to flow this way and expand out. So, anyway. Oh yeah, this I can already, I mean, this is one of the ones that I like to do as a demo because the, the end results of these, they, they look pretty good, so. So the first one that you guys do at your, booth, at your station today, we're just gonna have you, we're gonna have you do this and then we're gonna have you put your color dot on there so we can identify them tomorrow. And then, uh, but one of the things that does make a Galaxy Marble nice is to put a backing on it. Dichro really pops on a dark backing. So often, as you can see with both, like with Toby's there, you take your dichroic and you put a nice dark cobalt or a black behind it, it's gonna make that dichroic pop a little bit more. These look great just as a clear marble. We do these with just clear, you can use, or a palm, nice transparent red can look nice, but for this first one that you guys make at your uh, spot today, well, we won't put a backing on, but I am gonna demonstrate a backing since we've got Mike filming and everything and it'll give us a little bit more time for uh, before lunch too. But the first one at your station will be just rounding this out, shaping it, taking it off, making the marble. Because adding the backing is a whole other skill set, but this is your uh, chance to get, get a little bit of that info. So I let, I let most of this, even, you know, I, I'm even gonna, I might as well stop now because I am going to add a backing. But as you can see, if I just keep heat it, heating this, you pretty much can get the marble to round out. So we'll let this cool down. I wouldn't want to add the backing on this on the marble this hot because you know again it's you have to think about what you're applying things to. Hot when you're applying glass, whatever you're applying needs to be hot, and usually what you're attaching it to needs to have a little be somewhat firm enough to receive it and act as a point of resistance so that you can give it a good connection. Let's see here, use this nice little blue. So okay, this wrapping is not easy. And you get, I mean, it's just something that, again, that comes with practice that you guys can get this. But if you can learn this, if you can teach yourself this technique, it is really handy. I use it in all sorts of things. Of course, color is expensive. If you have a really expensive color, you can take, should take this technique I'm gonna show you, wrap it over clear, and now you have a clear core, but you know, something looks, you know, well, that's really helpful for sculpture and things like that. Of course, color is one of the main, you know, one of the more expensive costs of being a Pyrex lamp worker. All right, so here we go. This is a rub your belly, pat your head type of uh, project. And I'm gonna explain this for a right-handed person, but you'll, you guys, you know, you can reverse it for yourselves. And so, right-handed person. First of all, at this point, you, you need to apply yourself, your non-dominant hand to just be your rotating hand. So, your left hand is rotating towards you, your right hand is rotating away from you. So the color rod's gonna be rotating away from you, the left hand rotates towards you. Your right hand is going to be rotating very rapidly, and the left hand, your left hand is actually rotating the marble a little bit slower. I want to show you just one quick little demo. I think this is actually a, a good visual impact. 
because this is why we need to rotate our glass. Again, you, most of you guys are soft glass people. I'm gonna show you something that you could never do with a soft glass rod, but how, how amazing this is. And this, and this is really good. This is why we wanna rotate the glass. So here's a black rod, right? Here we go. Imagine this is soft glass. One apple, two apple, three apple, four apple, five apple, six apple, seven apple, eight apple. Look at that, can you see the color difference? It's bright on that side, it's dark on the other. What dark glass is not moving, it's not molten. So when you go to apply this, if you're not rotating your color, you're only superheating one side and you're gonna end up dragging your color. Dragging color traps air. Dragging color pulls you out of the flame. As soon as you're out of the flame, as I was telling you, you're losing temperature so you can't apply this glass. So we're rotating, the tip of this glass is gonna be in the flame, rotating, heating it in 360 degrees so that it actually will be fluid and be laid down. What I know, again, what will happen, is, because you're gonna be figuring this out, you will end up pulling yourself out of the flame. But what I, my whole concentration here is, before I even start to apply this, I will have the tip of the color rod liquid, so it's almost like I hit the ground running. So I have this nice and fluid. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna have these kind of steep angles. Again, the right hand is gonna rotate very rapidly. And I'm only gonna go down right to about the equator of the marble. You know, you don't want that to go past that. So here we go. I'm gonna get the tip of this hot. I'm gonna start at the top, start at the top and work down in just a spiral motion. Get the top hot, boom. Rotating, see how fast that blue is rotating. Working right into the previous seam. That's what's important. Don't drop your hand and create gaps. The act of rotating up with the color up and towards the previous seam expels air. If you try to do this and rotate the color towards yourself, you're actually going to fold over the previous seam and trap air. That said, the only other person that I know that does this technique as well as I do rotates in the opposite direction and I've never understood it, but I can't fault him because he's a famous glass blower and he knows what he's doing. But for you guys, I want you to focus on rotating up and into the previous scene because that just, again, mechanically forces the glass into the corner and expels air versus what you most likely would do is to fold over the previous scene and pull air into it. As I get to the end, I focus the heat on the glass rod and I do a little pulling motion and just taper it off at the end, trying not to pull glass into your lens. Done properly, this is seamless. There's no high point, low point. Everything melts in. I already have a co cohesive finish on the back of that. That's, you know, for this marble, that's fine. If I wanted to, I could start adding layers. When you guys go to do this, again, this will be, if you try this technique, it's gonna be on your second marble. You'll be fighting this a little bit, but once you have it, like I said, the instruction is there. It's just about getting that glass so you're not fighting that color rod. This hand is just like, rotating to give you a place to lay the glass down. We don't want it in the flame because if this gets super hot, all of a sudden your clear surface and the blue are merging and you're not really applying the color down. So I want you to think about the marble as the platform for which you are applying that color to. So, exhale. So, you all, you all got that? Yeah. Done properly. When I do this, it's not unusual for me on a larger marble to have to apply two to three coats of color to achieve the thickness or back milling. But when people are starting out, they have a tendency to lay it down much thicker. And so I only let most students do one coating because they're gonna have to melt all that color in. So, and if you are doing it in between coats, you may, make sure you resolve your surface because by resolving the surface, when you put that second coat in, you won't be trapping air bubbles in any type of gaps. If while you're doing it, you notice that you, your hand drops and it makes a gap between that and the previous scene, just work through it. Keep your momentum of heat, finish off, and then come back later and backfill those holes. All right, so time to just do our shaping on this. We've all been through this before, so we know what to do here. But uh, we're gonna focus the heat on the back. We want a little bit where that color you can see now. There's a small seam at the equator. So I wanna make sure I'm getting heat into the low point there. But again, protecting this area where the marble and the rod meet because that's my point of support. If I have a flame coming down there and heating that and it gets away from me, you're not gonna be able to exert pressure and you're gonna lose control. So again, it's on you guys to you know, you want to prevent yourself. This is, this is your feet on the ground. You don't want to take your own legs out. That's your whole support. So, you know, you've got to just be very, it's that presence of mind again. Let the heat 
I'm letting the heat, you know, transfer into the marble, and it gives me a longer window of working time than, again, coming in from the side where this heat is spilling over to the to the rod stock and, again, getting floppy or getting away from me. Remember, rotating the glass, it doesn't have to, you just need to be responding to the glass. Don't feel like you have to be going fast the whole time. That doesn't actually always serve you very well. Just try to do, rotate at a comfortable pace that keeps you on center. It's not a race. Sometimes I feel like people get, they're, they're gonna burn themselves out too quick. So all right, got some nice heat. Gonna come down to the mold, entering the mold at a 45 degree angle, rotating always as we enter the mold. Gently as we start and as the marble cools down, we can apply some more pressure. I'm not stirring the pot. As I've mentioned before, there's nothing achieved by moving your marble around like this. Just moving from 45 degrees down and dropping your hand works the entire surface of the marble. You're not affecting any other part of the marble by doing this other than possibly it exerting a force of gravity down on your marble, which will work against you. Again, you're never in your marble mold perpendicular to the mold. You achieve nothing by having being in that position in your mold. So again, even by that little example I did for you guys, I can see that I kind of mushroom capped this out a little bit. And of course, I'd rather have an egg. Again, high quality paddle. I use this in the flame all the time to divert heat. On a small marble like this, but with a big flame, that flame still wants to sneak around. So I'll put my paddle in the flame and divert all the velocity and force of that flame straight onto the end and prevent that sneaker flame from coming around and heating up my the rod. Again, what I'm doing, by doing this, I allow myself a longer window of time in the flame without losing control. And to shape a marble, you've got to get it hot. Again, most, the most common thing for people starting out is that they're trying to shape their marble after it's already too cold or not going into the mold hot enough so that they're not really achieving anything and it just becomes a, a back and forth process. You've got to have heat for the glass to move. Slow rotations. Oh, this is something else I want to talk about real quick because I didn't talk about this with shaping. It's really important when you're doing this that you drop your hand slowly. Again, for whatever reason, people want to go up here, they're rotating, and then they drop their hands down to here. That doesn't really work out. And I have a little metaphor for that. We're all familiar with like the red stripe on a barber pole, right? So we're at the, we're at the, we're at the barber pole factory. You, have, you go up to the white pole, it's spinning. You take your red paint, you, you start at the top, you swipe down, you've got a red stripe on there, right? Oh, you came back for lunch, you had a few two martinis. You, this time when you go up, you start at the top with the red paintbrush and you slowly bring your hand down. What happens? What happens? It gets entirely red because the pole's rotating and because you go down slowly, you paint the entire surface. It's not a red stripe, you've worked the entire surface. That's what's happening on your marble. If you're up here rotating and then you just drop your hands, you've actually skipped an area of the marble where you're not shaping. So when we're shaping our marble, we want complete rotations as we're moving up and down because that works the entire surface. Remember, your mold, your marble is not in the mold being compacted by the walls of that. It's a single edge. And so if that single edge, if you skip by that area, you're not really compressing your marble. So yeah, keep that in mind. I, I, it's just one of those things. Everybody wants to drop fast and they want to stir the pot. And, you know, those are just, I, it must be just, yeah, 40,000 years of making soup. <laughs> yeah, more super models. All right, so what, what's our time check? Anybody? 11.23. Oh, beautiful. So we're just going to get this off of here. We'll be done. Come in with our cold weld. Medium flame, you know, not, not just our center fire for this. We want to break in on both sides. We're just going to see a little color coming to the tip of the rod. Your marble, marble already has heat, so often when you go to do this, you'll go in and your marble will get color right away and your rod won't. So just keep that in mind. It might take a sec. Sometimes it's worth it to get a little bit more heat in the rod before you make that attachment. Then again, I come in, I see a little bit of color come out of the flame, wait until the color's leaving. I'm super shaky for coffee. Try that again. Again, I just kind of put the toe down. I don't fully commit. I rotate, shift it in the center. Again, if you just take that punty, again, it's intuition. People just want to put that on there and push. And you just make such a large footprint. You're like fully committing at that point. This is a non-committal relationship here. We want that thing to come off easy. And so 
just tentatively put it on, get it into position, and then as it's cooling, if you want, give it a little bit of a nudge and maybe you get yourself a little bit more adhesion. But for the most part, that cold weld is all about coming off easy. So again, not the flint. Notice the angle, I'm cutting up into the rod. Most of the marble's done. I do not want to heat that. I do not want to take this rod off and be pulling away glass from the marble, distorting the shape. I'd rather get this off and then with a lot of control, I can come in here and see what needs to happen. So I'm looking, obviously there's a little bit of a nipple of glass on there. We'll do our little visual cutoff exercise starting at the back of the marble. Follow the curve of the marble and cut through there. And it just gives you that little bit of information like, all right, I, I, need to, I don't need that whole thing gone. I need about maybe just about half of that nipple gone. And then I'm gonna have the right amount of material. So don't overheat your glass, just take off a little bit. It's a lot easier to, you know, it's like that, what is that, measure once, cut twice, or is that the wrong way, I think it's so, yeah. Measure twice, cut once, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, I don't want to superheat this marble, I just want that nipple to be hot, because that will, if that glass is hot, when I go into the mold, it will just go right into the curvature that's already existing, but if I get too much of the marble hot, then I will just be, again, I'm just setting myself up for more sh shaping and work. Again, this with a nipple like that, we're going to enter at a 45 degree angle, gently rotating, just let that start to push in. Then I can start to drop my hand, that forces the glass to the outer edges. When we're using our mold, when we're dropping our hands, it's still creating friction and drag. It's pulling glass to the outside. When we go up, if we're applying pressure, it's pushing glass to the front. So keep that in mind. And again, it's those concepts that allow you to figure out how to put glass where you want it. And the mold is, you know, that's that ability to create friction and drag allows you to push the glass around on the surface of a marble, which would seemingly not have a place for you to push against or to shape. So, oh my goodness, I talk so much. I just need to record this class and then have the recording play while I work. <laughs> That's how I do my, my webinar. I filmed my webinar like four years ago. We run it every six months. It's awesome. I just get it narrated. In fact, another thing, if you guys, you know, they do run that, uh, they run a webinar on this marble through the Flow Mag. We do it about twice a year. I think it's, they just change it. If you buy the webinar once, you have a lifetime subscription to it. It's true. So like for 80, I think that it's 80 or 90 bucks for the webinar. 89. Yeah. And then you have, so again, you have like this demo in perpetuity, so kind of good deal. All right, here we go, look at that, boom. Wow. Oh, oh, yeah. Is that good, Mike? It's fucking awesome. Again, no burnout, bright color. It's so much about protecting that coating and just, and, and taking all the caution in the world, like I was saying, and then after you get comfortable with it, you're gonna realize like, oh, but, but if you want, if when you, at the end, when you look at your results, if you see little areas, you just, you know, I want you to, to know. I think you need to put a black dot on it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so this one's, get a small flame ready. Into, again, into one of these cups that will hold it. Oh, look at that beautiful release. Again, level out the torch, honey mark facing outward rotation around the punny mark so that the glass relaxes to the outside and does not beat up. Again, our intuition is to take a punny mark and go right onto the punny mark with that heat. When you go right onto that punny mark, the glass actually, glass goes where the heat is. So if you're dead center, the glass beads up to the center. By heating the outer edge of a punny mark, the glass not only relaxes to the center, but to the outside. So that's how you make a nice punny mark. And then you can use the light. I always look around like that putty mark's good. And then it doesn't count. 